hi everybody and welcome to the super exciting episode two of the See Sporty Be Sporty podcast. Woo! <laughs> so Carrie Dunn and I had so much fun last time that we are back for another chat and we've recorded it because we thought some people might be interested. So in case you don't know me, my name is Natalie Jackson. I am director and co-founder of the social enterprise company Totally Runnable and the See Sporty Be Sporty campaign. We do a lot of work with schools about closing the gender sport gap, helping schools to measure and close that gap. And the See Sporty Be Sporty campaign is all about role models. We use the tagline, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So our latest project, we are working on a set of posters that um, is going to be put in front of primary schools all across the country, ideally, um, that will show role models, female girl role models, um, and we'll put those in front of girls and boys in the effort to show them that they can be whoever they want to be. And if being sporty is part of that, then great. So um, we are super excited. Oh, I should introduce Carrie again. And I mean, I assume everybody knows who you are now, Carrie. <laughs> if not, Carrie is um, a sports writer, journalist, absolutely awesome human being. And I love her opinion. I love hearing her opinion on so many of these issues because it's, it is a different spin to what you might hear in other places. And you do have insight into the industry, Carrie. So thank you so much for being back with us today. We should thank you for asking me. Well, you, it's, it's lovely to have you. So we should mention your, um, your books, your two most recent books. Um, tell us about those. Yep, the two most recent books, um, The Roar of the Lionesses was out in 2016 about women's football in England. My dog has just walked in. Hello. Um, and it's then TV podcast without a dog. I know. Well, it was yours last time, and now mine. Come sit on their blanket. Come here, then. Come say hello. <laughs> and then 2019's uh, Pride of the Lionesses, which um, was recently long listed for Sports Book of the Year, but it's all kind of been put on pause because oh. of the pandemic. So I didn't get a party for it, and I don't know what's happening about to any of it. Oh, no. Long listing was quite exciting. So there was that. Lovely. And where can people buy your books? Um, at your local independent book retailer. <laughs> um, get in touch with the nearest shop on your high street and they can order it in for you. Fantastic. And we are super excited. You might have seen her popping up already to have with us the awesome Catherine Spencer. Um, I haven't met you, Catherine, so it's lovely to meet you. Hello. <laughs> So for anybody who doesn't know, Catherine is um, an absolute legend of England rugby. She is former England rugby union captain. You captained England at the 2010 World Cup. You played in the 2006 World Cup. You played in eight Six Nations, won six of them. Absolute legend on the podcast. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, and as well as that, so you retired, is it 2011 you retired? I did. I keep saying last year, but now what is it? Nine years, <laughs> nine years ago. I can't say last year anymore, can I? I? I retired from England International Rugby in 2011, and then I carried on playing a bit of um, a bit of club rugby after that. Yeah, but I, I don't play anymore. I'm properly the boots properly hung up now. <laughs> and tell us what else you've been up to recently, then. Oh goodness, various various projects. But while we're on a while we're on a theme of books, a little bit behind Carrie, but I have one book <laughs> that I've written um, called Mudmore Mascara that was out earlier this year. Fortunately for me, before lockdown, which meant that I could have a little launch party. That's what it's all about, really, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. But I have actually read your book, which ah. didn't come as a surprise, other than I don't really know anything previously. I didn't really know very much at all about rugby. I never played rugby at school. We never had the option of playing rugby at school. And to me, it was very much as a child portrayed as, as a boy's sport. That, that is how, how it was at, at my school. And um, I've watched some rugby, but really because other people have been watching it. And it's only really been doing the job that I do now that I've got more interested in other sports and looking into, into um, other sports. Really. I think I was given a very small view of what sport was at school and it, you know I think um, a lot of people did very well out of that and if they were sports that you got along with then great but rugby just wasn't something I knew an awful lot about so I have really enjoyed your book really found it really interesting in terms of learning about rugby but also about your experience and I think there's a lot of things that tied in with what we see in the work that we do your experience I thought it was a super honest book I felt like we got to know you which is great I think um 
I, I'm always looking for getting to know the, the authors of, of books and particularly in a book like this, but it was about your dreams. It was about, you know, dreams becoming a reality. Some dreams not becoming a reality, even though you dream them. It was about self-doubt. It was being a girl, but also playing a sport that isn't stereotypically a girly sport. You know, people, people might not expect you when they meet you that you for you to be a rugby player you know you told stories about meeting people and then just thinking that you were Catherine and not a rugby player or not the England captain or you know that kind of thing and I found that really interesting was it was it difficult to write it's so honest and sort of open it was and I'm 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 always really pleased when kind of um non-rugby people have read the book and said they've enjoyed it because that was one of the things that was really important to me that it was a it was kind of about the person behind the behind the rugby player really and and showing that there is a there is a human being with emotions um, lots of emotions in this case behind that story so there were some little technical rugby bits in there but not not too much so first I'm really really glad you enjoyed it but yeah it was a it was a really honest book I thought if I'm going to do this I have to I have to do it properly <laughs> um you know and it was it is sort of my about me and about my feelings and specifically for me about not you know not winning world cups and the kind of the emotional toil of that really um and you know it's something that happens to a lot of sports people you know we achieve to kind of reach a target and to be the best that we can and and quite often we do loads of really good stuff but we don't get the one thing that we want and that and that's really hard to deal with and then um, you know it happens to a lot of sports people and so many people have said that i have kind of have similar th feelings and i think it's really important to kind of get these emotions out into the public eye and say, actually, you know, it's okay. It's normal to think like that. Do you know something, Kath? One of the things I like most about your book, um, as Nat says, is the honesty of it, but also the fact that you're kind of, you're angry, you're frustrated. And these are emotions that I think women in general, but particularly female athletes, don't get to express very often. We're supposed to be kind of gracious and happy and smiling. Oh, well, I love playing. So, you know, it's not so bad. And you're like, no, I'm really angry. I'm annoyed that I didn't get to do this. Did you ever think about editing this out? Or were you happy all the way through? I, uh, perhaps I'll do another book with the bits that I did edit out. <laughs> um, no, I thought it was really important. You know, I, I did feel a lot of, you know, anger as I was trying to deal with, you know, not winning. And, and I suppose just, you know, for those people that, that haven't read it, it's quite a few still out there. <laughs> um, it was um, <laughs> in 2014 after I'd retired, England went on to win the World Cup. And that's what sort of really then stirred up a whole load of emotions in me. And you're right, Carrie, I was kind of, I was quite angry, but I was sort of, bitter I was jealous that other people had, had achieved my dream and that was really really difficult to manage I remember I'll talk about in the book watching the women's rugby team win team of the year at the sports personality of the year which is huge they were I think the second female team in about 50 years to win the award so it's a massive thing you know something that I've personally been sort of drive you know we all have drive in the development of women's sport and you know everything like this and I just remember sat on my sofa at home another emotional point with you just this this teardrop running down my the side of my face watching this moment and just thinking oh you know I was I was really chuffed that it happened but actually I just found it so hard to watch because I wanted to be out there <laughs> but that's not it's human nature isn't it and it it was really important to me to kind of put that put that down on print and yeah they're kind of quite a raft of emotions in there and there is yeah there is some anger <laughs> and there is some bitterness about my own experiences but also about the sport about women's sport and and I guess different levels of discrimination that we've all faced at different times and in I, the, you know when you say that I think about the bit where you said look I didn't go like I, I didn't go into being a professional sports person to pave the way for somebody else to do my dream you know that's not it was a selfish thing wanting to win and wanting to be my best player but inevitably you end up paving the way for other people and actually there is so much in that that I guess you can look back on and go, well, that was great. You know, we paved the way, but that doesn't take away the emotion of, of it not happening to you. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, you're exactly right. You know, you don't, you don't wake up and think, oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to lay out this path for others to, to follow. You don't do that, but it, it is part of the job. And you know what? It's, it's a really great, joyful, pleasurable part of the job, you know, and, and if you don't want to do that part, you shouldn't really be doing it. Um, you know, is 
if, if you were to get a job description it's, it's part of it and whether we like the word role model or not that that's kind of what you become whether it's to one person or hundreds of people or, or thousands of people so you have to take that very kind of that part of the job very very responsibly um but yeah we don't don't wake up striving to do that but I talk about you know I, I, I played in an era that was very very amateur to a lot less amateur <laughs> not quite into the not quite into the professional era and it was a really nice really nice time to to be part of it and to kind of look back and think oh yeah you know help help that along the way a little bit but yeah internally and finding it hard to say I'd take all that back if I could lift the world cup maybe that with the, the of what you said you made some really important things in there I think interesting for me I had really no no idea about the inner workings of rugby I didn't know that you would all at the time that you and not that long ago like you think if it was 20 30 years ago maybe but not that long ago 10 years ago you all had full-time jobs this wasn't something you did as a job which seems crazy how could you compete on a world stage unless everybody's not got full-time jobs which you know I guess may have been the case but like to me not no not coming from a rugby background how could you compete against people the best in the world and you know get to a world cup final whilst also having a full-time job that seems insane yeah I mean we were I guess we we're on a bit of a level playing field so there were no not really any sort of profession women's rugby was not professional by any means at that point um some countries had more professional setups than we did in england we were lucky we were supported really really well um you know got strength and conditioning support medical support but we still did have to go to work um another thing i mentioned in the book uh, myself and sophie hemming training at bath university and, and david blackman was one of the bath internationals at the time was like, why, why are you always here so early I was like we've got to go to work after she had absolutely no idea that we had to do this and um thought you were early so, yeah and I I hate early mornings <laughs> I really do but just had to just had to get used to it so but that's what we did you know and actually I kind of think now would I want to be a full-time sports person a full-time athlete and I don't know if I would I, I wouldn't I'd quite happily be part-time <laughs> <laughs> get a bit more sleep but I think it's really important that we do other stuff I think it probably helps our performance on the pitch as well and being totally immersed into one world I think is is quite a difficult thing and on the role models front I guess what I, the story I thought of um a moment ago was the story when you said you know you in terms of being a role model you, whilst you didn't intend necessarily to be a role model you end up finding yourself in that situation but as a captain you're having to go out and having you know not won the world cup i don't want to say lost the world cup you came second in the world that's it you know that's but that's, how I, yeah that's how i felt yeah. yeah and having lost the world cup you know you've, you've got gone so far like that was your dream and then you've got to go out and you say you had you felt like you had to go out and represent women's rugby you had to go out and represent women's sport women's rugby and you're thinking in that press conference immediately after you can't think about how you feel I felt like I really related to that kind of situation. And I think a lot of people, a lot of women, but a lot of people in general would relate to that kind of situation. How did it feel to have to go out and, and represent something rather than just be something? Um, yeah, I mean, there were times when it was really hard. Like you say, I remember feeling at the end of the 2010 World Cup final when we just lost by three points. Um, and it was such a difficult moment, really, really hard. But then I remember thinking, like, we've just got this opportunity. We've got this small relatively small window of opportunity to continue to promote our sport and it was really really important to me then that we did that you know we, we weren't paid but we had these we had these jobs to do and as captain it was a massive part of my a massive part of my job but it was it was really difficult in the press conference immediately following that and then after that you know in the aftermath of it you know it had to sort of springboard of us in the media so we had to keep that going we had to carry that on and you know, actually I really enjoyed kind of the the speaking part of it and you know and representing the sport you know through public speaking or media work whatever else I did really enjoy that part of it as much as it was hard talking about that that World Cup talking out about the sport in general talking about rugby talking about women's sport I did enjoy and I think you know there's so many more people doing it now isn't there which is really really good and we're kind of part of this wave that is possibly going to be a bit impacted at the moment I guess we'll talk about that later um but I it's great representing something wider being part of a team is brilliant isn't it whether that's a team of two or three or whether that's 10 or 100 or whether that's a team of thousands of people now globally pushing for something bigger it's, it's quite a special feeling 
Yeah, definitely. Carrie, do you think from a sort of media journalism perspective, do you think we put as much, is that sports person thing that we do? Do we put that um, pressure on to all sports people to represent something bigger than themselves? Or is that, is the more pressure on female athletes to do that? I think there's more pressure on female athletes to do that but I think it's not just a sport thing I think it's true in many many walks of life I mean it's you know it, it's this, this the thing that you see when someone's criticizing women drivers because one female driver has done something bad on the road when they've been driving and it's like one woman represents all women in a way that men are never expected to do so I think there is that additional pressure for women but women athletes when you're trying to carve out this space for yourself in the media when you know that sometimes there are uh, not negative forces in the press but there are people who might be a little bit um, ambivalent towards what you do on the field of play who haven't been interested in you before you've got to kind of make yourself interesting make yourself compelling you've got to give them reasons for wanting to cover this sport but then you might want to think oh am I being too aggressive about this because that's what always gets leveled at women who try and assert themselves they're being bossy they're being aggressive and I think there's lots and lots of conflicting pressures on female athletes as they try and get a space in the media yeah I've had another look at the newspapers on that note, very like brief look at the papers, but this was Friday. I bought the nine national newspapers again, as I do, and I tallied up. So Catherine, I don't know if you've seen, but we, we did something for the uh, origins of the C Sporty, B Sporty campaign. We we're in 2018, where we looked at all the nat nine national newspapers and we tallied up the numbers of photos of somebody playing sport and across the year we did one day a month for a year and we found that less than three percent of photos of somebody playing sport in the national newspapers were women playing sport mm. so it probably didn't surprise us that there were more photos of men than women but actually it kind of did surprise us how how small a number so um right before the we started the podcast i did another tally up for the chat that I had with Carrie last time. So I've done it again for this time. We're now sort of two months into lockdown. There isn't an awful lot of sport going on. We are now in the UK or in England, at least having some, um, some reigniting of sport in general. Training is starting to happen again, you know, that kind of thing. But actually there isn't an awful lot to report on in terms of sport. But what we found in the stats, um, you're not going to like it again, Carrie. Um, <laughs> Um, I found that so in terms of photos I looked at photos and I looked at stories and three out of 95 photos showed women so that's 3.2% and out of stories so there are a total of 225 stories about sport in general um, and 14 of those were about women's sport so 6.2% and I think we were on 5 something percent last month so a uh, slight increase from last month <laughs> small victories but what I found most interesting when I looked at the stories was there were so most of them were, were football most of the stories about about women's sports so it was out of the 14 stories seven of them it was seven sort of distinct stories and four of those were about women's football so and I know you say in your book Catherine it's it you know football it, it does tend to dominate in, in general around sport and certainly in terms of the sports coverage in papers if you look through if you do as I do and buy the, the nine you know national newspapers and look through football is the dominant sport but there was rugby cricket formula one darts horse racing tennis athletics cycling the, you know there was a broad spread of of sport in general but of those seven stories, four were about football. One was another, another Phil Neville, England manager situation. He's talking about wanting to mm. step into club football, whether that means women's or men's. I don't know if he's clarified this, but I think we know. But yeah, let's, let's move on. Um, we had a story about there being more female football coaches. So the FA is pushing for more female coaches, and that's that. But that was a tiny little story. There are more female coaches. Was basically the story. Um, the new uh, Manchester, Manchester City women's coach, Gareth Taylor, he's an ex Sheffield United striker. So he, he was, that was women's sport, accounted that. But again, of those, of those, of two of those three stories were about men in, in women's sport. So 
interesting. Um, and Enya Luko, the former England player, has she did a, a she wrote an article um, which was good, but again, it was sort of answering the fact that she had tweeted something about people being furloughed, and she was having to explain her tweet, which was kind of not really about. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, we had uh, an update about cricket. So one of the papers had a here's what's going on in cricket, and there was all of these things here, and then there was women's cricket, which nice to see when you don't see it in other places, um, but a little bit like also women's cricket. Um, and then Dina Asher Smith, there was an article, there was two stories about her, but the basic story was she'd been running in a park where there was some deer, and one of the headlines actually said, go eyes in it. So that was irritating. Um, and then there was two of those stories were about women's sport on a knife edge. And this is where I was coming, I am coming to a point, I promise. Um, the, so women's sport being on a knife edge and what's happening with women's sport in general through the lockdown. And there was um, rugby player Rachel Burford was quoted in one of the stories. But then it seemed as though the whole focus of the story by the end of it was saying that she didn't have a grip on current affairs because what she was talking about, it was a straight, really strangely worded article, but she was talking about Tyrrell's, the crisp company having been the sponsors and they are now no longer the, they're no longer going to be the key sponsors um, for the team. And she was saying, look, this is an opportunity for somebody else to come in. We don't want to um, undersell it, you know, and, and the crux of the rest of the story was undersell it, try selling it. She's, doesn't know what's going on. So it was a really straight, that was one of the only, other than any Luko writing her story and Dina Asher Smith, there were some quotes from a BBC documentary. I noticed that Rachel Burford was the only quoted female athlete, female sports person. And then the quote was kind of questioned immediately below, which was a, seemed like a really strange juxtaposition for me. Um, I guess what either of you, what do you guys think about, uh, about that story, about the way it might have been presented. Um, do we think women's sport is on a knife edge? I think, yeah, that's one of the major themes that we're talking about women's sport, isn't it, at the moment? Um, you know, is it, is it in a bit of a precarious situation? I suppose you have to look at different types of sports. We're looking at elite end and then we're looking at participation, um, as, as they are having to do in, in men's sport. But I guess are we going to sort of see where we are on the pecking order? Are we going to are we going to see women's sport struggle a bit more with regard to rugby and um, and the, the story you mentioned um, with Rachel Burford? So yeah, Tyrrells sponsored the, the kind of domestic top domestic league in, in English rugby, which was good. First time we've had a sponsor for that. I actually. Um, it was a bit vocal on the media a little while before that to say actually they weren't the most engaged sponsor it's good that we had a sponsor but actually it'd be a really good opportunity to get to get a new sponsor that might be a bit more um proactive in their in their kind of engagement with the with the sport is that going to be tougher at the moment or actually is this an opportunity for organizations to come in and and be engaged with with sport not having to spend the bucks that they might do um on on men's sport but it's difficult isn't it the pressure is going to be on the national governing bodies isn't it to, to support women's sport to a certain degree um the rfu have said that they are ring fencing money to to secure the payments of our top paid players and the money that they support with the top premiership clubs below that i think that's where clubs are going to really struggle aren't they and um, they're going to struggle anyway what can they afford to keep going but it might ultimately come down to a, a financial decision. And, and when clubs are back up and running, what's going to draw more people into the clubs? What's going to draw more people to spend their money over the bars? And, and still, a lot of the time, that, that's men's sport. Whether that's right or wrong, it's the way it's kind of promoted and marketed, isn't it? So I'm sure there will be a lot of clubs in lots of different sports that might have to make a really, really tough decision to say that actually we can't, we're going to have to really kind of cut back and we can't support our, our women's teams it doesn't mean that they don't want to um, so I guess we're gonna have to look to see how national government national governing bodies re respond to this at the moment yeah I mean talk about obviously football is the sport that I know best and you know we've seen repeatedly when men's 
clubs have been struggling for money, whether it's been in a global recession or whether it's because the men's team's been relegated and obviously their funding's been reduced. It's the women's team that's, that's, gets, that gets, that gets the brunt of it. It's the women's team that's cut, that's the first to go. So I'm very concerned about elite women's football. Obviously the WSL and Championship have been curtailed. They haven't yet decided how they're going to finish the season. I mean, I think probably ultimately it was the right decision to finish it like that because we're seeing the Premier League, men's Premier League going back, but then they've got the money to be able to have a stadium open and empty and not worry about the ticket sales because the broadcasting money is going to be important there. But the same thing would not be the case in elite women's football. Um, and I think Kath's right to point out the issues at grassroots clubs as well. Um, and that's the same in men's sport as well. Um, are we going to see grassroots clubs fold? And then my partner's tennis club is very, very worried about money. They've been closed for two months. They're starting to get some singles back now. But, you know, who wants to play singles all the time? They want to play doubles. They want the social aspect of it, which is obviously a big part of participation at grassroots is the social angle. So, yeah, it is, um, it is a very worrying time for a lot of sport. And, yeah, I think women's sport particularly uh, is at risk. I mean, I don't know whether you saw the press conference yesterday that the culture secretary gave and he was talking about the relaunch of the Premier League and he did specify that women's sport needed to be supported and that it had been great that a women's sport had come into the spotlight blah 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 but then he said something that actually quite annoyed me and everyone was thinking it was great on Twitter and I was thinking oh it's me being picky again but he said he thought it was really important for little girls to see female athletes at the top level and I was like also, little boys. Little it's boy. really important for little boys. I know the girl, athletes. I know the boys. Okay, so it wasn't just me. <laughs> he said it was important for our daughters, wasn't it, to see female athletes. That's so it. I actually, I, I replied on Twitter, Carrie, and said it's also important for our sons. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it's such a big point, isn't it? And it, that actually kind of goes into lots of sports, isn't it? It's like saying, well, we can only have female coaches in female sport or we can only have female referees in female sport or only girls are allowed to watch female sport or only women. And it's just, this is so wrong, isn't it? You know, I grew up watching men's sport because that's what was there and I absolutely loved it and I would still watch it. It would have been nice to watch women's sport as well if it was around. But yeah, it's just a little comments like that. They all, they all add up, don't they? And mm. it's, um, yeah, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you brought that out. I feel better now. <laughs> but I think, I think it's important also to make it okay to question comments like that. And I know in the, in the first podcast, I, we were talking about the papers and I was talking about the sports section and I said, oh, like the normal sports section and Carrie pulled me up on it. And that, I think that's so important to do that because I think we have all been grown up in a world where it is how it is. And um, I think it, it is important to, to allow a space to be able to say, well, hang on, you know, we need to question that. And it needs to be okay. Either, I mean, I don't know what his, his view looking back on it would be but even for him to go oh gosh yeah you know of course that that is what I meant I need to say that differently I need to be more careful with my words because like you say Kath it is a case of that it's one little thing but one little thing and one little thing and one little thing it all adds up and it adds up. I know you, you talked in your book about having gone to a coaching session and seen it was a female coach and your heart sank and you thought you know not recently obviously but you know yeah. when you were younger and your heart sinks thinking oh it's it's a female coach and actually it's so important to be able to question that and for you not to be I guess shamed for thinking well, why would you think that you know you we I think I've definitely had that thought about and I think I know I've said it before you know even in our office I'll say things like with my daughter I'll say oh, I'll take her to the doctor and see what he says and somebody will say oh why is it a he and it's of course it's not a he that what an outrageous thing to say but I remember being as a child, you know, I had the alphabet on my wall and D was a doctor and it was a man. And I remember being, I think, five years old and having a conversation with my dad about how, don't be silly, daddy, you know, women are nurses, men are doctors. And in my head, I thought that they were, that that's what the men do and that's what the women do. And of course, they're both important jobs, but they're different jobs. And, you know, my, my view of it was that, oh, the doctor, the, that's a man. And I think we do need to be able to question that. We need to be able to say, well, hang on, that's just because that's what you've seen. You know, if you can't see it, you can't see it. If all we're seeing is male coaches, and, you know, I read a stat in a particular um, region, I think it was South Yorkshire, had, had, a couple of years ago, had 5% of all coaches were female. Well, uh, football this was. Um, you know, and so it is, it's tricky. And until we're seeing more 
female coaches, female commentators, female uh, pundits, you know, that kind of thing. We are going to be used to seeing men talk about men's sport and women's sport. And it, it is, how important do you guys think it is to, to create that space to make it okay to go, oh yeah, no, I definitely need to change my language there. I think it's such a, com I think it's a really, really complex issue because I think there's sort of cultural aspects at play, societal aspects at play. Um, also our own kind of um, expectations of ourselves, of, you know, what's okay in, in our kind of personal lives and family life. And actually, is it okay to go and spend four hours, five hours at a, a sports club um, coaching? Is there something like deep rooted and ingrained into us that actually we, we don't be doing that sort of stuff where, you know, or those of us that are parents, we're spending more time at home. I think it's a really, really complex issue. However, there are lots and lots of women <laughs> who want to be doing things like this, who want to be coaching more. And um, I think you're right now. I think it's very important to have, to see it <laughs> so that we can be it, you know, um, just as a real, and I think particularly for women, um, I think we gain confidence through experience. So that's either our own experience or the experience of others that we can see. So it's like a really, really simple, simple example. Um, when I was working for the RFU and I was working to develop women girls rugby, I put on a um, tournament for, for girls schools rugby. Um, and it was at the time when we were just starting to offer a form of contact rugby to girls in secondary school. Until then it had only been tag rugby, which is, is non-contact, which is a great sport in itself. Um, quite a lot of the girls wanted to play it, but it was the teachers that didn't want to didn't play it. They were very scared by it, um, which is natural, you know, if they're not used to it. Um, so I had this tournament and I purposefully set up the, the tag non-contact pitch quite close um, to, the, to the contact pitch. So it was easy to see what was going on. So at the start of the day, so many people were on the non-contact pitch there weren't very many on the contact pitch and gradually through the day just a few more girls would just trickle over trickle over trickle over and and play the play the contact game um, and then the teachers are like actually it's not it's not that complicated it's not as scary as i thought it would be just just because of that simple thing that they could just see it and it is such a powerful tool is it so many levels from you know from sort of a community sports tournament, school tournament, up until the elite end. And, you know, without dreams, without seeing something, it's, it's difficult to take those steps up, isn't it? Well, we only have a couple of minutes left. This half hour has flown by. I don't know about you guys. I've had all kinds of questions that I haven't asked yet. But um, I think the most important question for me is how can people find you guys? How can people connect with you guys and, and do more with you? So tell us where they can find you. So you can get me on Twitter at Kerry Sparkle or on Instagram at Kerry Sparkle one two three. I uh, I'm on not I'm not on Instagram because I'm I'm a slight technophobe, but I am on Twitter um, and I'm Kath Spence eight uh, on Twitter. So yeah, please do please do come and find me there and say hello. <laughs> Fabulous, and I am um, at Nat Jackson five two on Twitter. Um, we are at totally runnable on twitter and instagram or you can email me i'm nat at totally .com. so thank you both for joining me i am learning a lot about this podcasting lark um i hope people are enjoying it at home and i hope it's been fun to be a part of um and hopefully we'll be back with another episode so thank you very much guys Bye. 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 Bye.